I'm Matt Rosenberg. I'm a family physician in Jackson, Michigan. Um, today we had an opportunity to talk about nocturia. It's interesting, nocturia is an old disease. I mean, it's been around forever, obviously, for, ever since people have been around, but now there are some options for treatment. So we've kind of looking at it a little bit differently. The, the bottom line with nocturia, if we understand it, it's when you void more than two times, more or equal to two times a night, because that's what we look at as bothersome symptoms. There's nocturia and there's also nocturnal polyuria, and let me explain the difference. We can have a big prostate and have obstructed flow and have nighttime voiding because we're not peeing very well. We can have overactive bladder and have nocturia because we have a small bladder capacity. We could have sleep problems and it wakes us up and we're going to the bathroom, but we're actually having sleep problems, which is why we wake up and then once we're up, we void. And then there's overproduction of urine and that's what we call nocturnal polyuria. Now, if you look at the definition, it's about 20 to 33%, 20% of your production if you're young, 33% if you're old, and that is the nighttime volume of urine. So you're putting an excessive amount at night, which is why you're getting up. Now, if we think about it, what happens is your bladder is a fixed size regardless, and are relatively a fixed size. So you're introducing urine, and then when it fills up, you have to empty. So that's what nocturia and nocturnal polyuria are. So we know these are bothersome symptoms. We know people get affected. They can't sleep. If you can't function and sleep, if you can't sleep during the night, you're not going to be able to function. It affects work, it affects social, it affects your health. They say that if you're woken up within the first four hours of sleep, that's really bad and that's going to be what affects your production uh, or your, your, your productivity, should I say. So having said that, the question is what can we do about this? Somehow or another we need to decrease the urine volume that is going to the bladder. Now sometimes we can do behavioral modification, that's great. For example, if you're drinking a liter of water before you go to bed, the chances are you're going to have to empty it at some point during the night. Uh, sometimes it's medications. Sometimes like the diuretic you might be taking can be affected. Sometimes it's when the system is just not working appropriately. And then the question is, can we slow the kidney down? And the nice thing is there have been some new developments in, in the uh, pharma world that have provided molecules that are allowing us to kind of push a pause on the kidney. So years ago, we've all known about desmopressin. It's been around forever, but there have been problems with that and the side effects of hyponatremia, increasing intravascular volume, which can affect you if you have congestive failure. But now we have better molecules that are actually shorter acting, lower dose. So they go around to the uh, distal and collecting duct and they, they, they stop that uh, transfer of fluid so they keep the urine, or sorry, they keep the fluid in the system. They don't let it get excreted into the bladder, which means that you slow the urine production at night, the bladder fills less, and guess what? You sleep better. So by having these uh, lower doses, by, they're more bioavailable, so you're able to get lower doses, and by, by having a short, uh, short half-life, only a couple, four to six hours is actually the time that they're working, you're actually able to get away from the severe problems we've had in the past of hyponatremia, which is why we don't like to use those. And in the safety studies on the medications, it shows that the degree of hyponatremia is extremely low. In fact, if you look at it in more detail, you can isolate it to the elderly patient. And when you look at those patients who had it, it's the elderly patients. It was actually in the major study that was done, it was about five and it was about 1.5% had hyponatremia. And four of those were males and they were taking glucocorticoids, which are contraindicated. So if you use the medication safely, the concern about hyponatremia is gonna be very low. Now, that doesn't mean you don't follow it. Of course you do, you set them up on monitoring, you check it at zero days, uh, seven days, 30 days, and then periodically thereafter. I check it probably once a month for the first six months because that's when you'll see it. So the nice thing is we have really good opportunities out there for nocturia. I think this is what this means for the future is we can talk to the patients more readily about the problem, see if they have bothersome nocturia, and if they do, offer therapy when it's appropriate.